And that topic, well, I'll name it before I discuss it. The topic in question is the natural domain. And we'll dive right in with the obvious question of what's that? And we'll recall something from uh, Wednesday, I guess it must have been from last week. We made the observation that some inputs and break a function. So let's say f of x equals the square root of x, then f of negative two is not a real number. We cannot take the square root of a negative number. So this input breaks the function. Or if we have g of x, equals one divided by x. We cannot divide by zero. So if we plug zero in, we don't get anything back again. This zero breaks the function. And finding the natural domain is the process of asking, well, what values don't do this? What values give you perfectly nice outputs? That is to say, the natural domain is the set of all of the good inputs. And for our purposes at this point in time, there are two sort of problems an input might have. We cannot divide by zero, and we cannot take the square root of a negative number. And this I am going to talk about tomorrow, which so we'll talk about division by zero errors Tuesday. For now, let's see what that second observation gets us. The observation that we cannot take the square root of a negative number. So suppose that we have a function 
and this function has a square root in it. Let's say the square root of 2x minus 4. Now, we've just said that we can't take the square root of a negative number, and we are taking the square root of 2x minus 4. So, 2x minus 4 cannot be a negative. And saying that something isn't negative is the same as saying that it's greater than or equal to 0. So 2x minus 4 has to be greater than or equal to 0. And of course, now you can see why we waited until inequalities to talk about domain. This inequality we can solve, or we can hopefully solve. We can add four to both sides. And we can divide both sides by two. So if f of x is 2x minus 4, then x has to be greater than or equal to 2. And what we've just done is found the domain of this function. We'll sometimes just drop the natural and say domain. X has to be greater than or equal to two, otherwise we get the square root of a negative number. And any time you have a square root in your function, it's going to put some kind of restriction on x, or at least most of the time. Similarly, if g of x were the square root of 1 minus 5x, that square root puts restrictions on what x has to be. Because we can't take the square root of a negative number, and we are taking the square root of 1 minus 5x, 1 minus 5x isn't allowed to be negative. And then this inequality, like many inequalities before it, we can solve. We can add 5x to both sides. We can divide both sides by five. And once again, what we've just done is find a domain. If one minus five X were negative, it would break the function. So saying that one minus five X isn't negative, is the same as saying that this is a good input. The function doesn't break as long as 1 minus 5x is not negative. If we, no, let's ask now if anybody has questions about what's come so far questions about this concept, about where that inequality came from, about how we solved that inequality, 
or anything else. So you could add the 5x to the zero, even though the zero didn't have an x? Right. Um, you can add, I mean, if you like, you could think of, you could think of zero as a zero plus zero x, and then five x plus zero x is five x. What if, I mean, I've said that the only things that can break a function are division by zero errors or the square root of negative numbers. And I've said we're spreading this section out. So we'll do examples with division by tomorrow. Um, what this means, though, is suppose we don't have division and we don't have square roots. Suppose we have something like h of x equals 2x squared minus x plus 1. This function will never break because the only thing that can break a function are division and square roots, and we don't have either of those things. If a function never breaks, we say that the domain is all of the numbers or all of the real numbers, if we're being really fancy. Um, remember that the domain is the set of allowable inputs. It's the set of inputs that don't break the function. So this should make sense. If all of the numbers are okay, if the function never breaks, then all of the numbers are in the domain. Yeah. Or if you have something like k of x equals x squared, plus the square root of 2x plus 3. The only thing that could break this function are division by 0. Well, there's no division here, so there can't be any division by 0. Or if we take the square root of a negative number, well, we do have a square root. So to make sure that we're not taking the square root of a negative number, we need what's under the square root not to be negative. And you'll notice that that x squared is not affecting anything. It's not division, it's not a square root, it's not affecting the domain. We just have, if we subtract three from both sides and divide both sides by two, it's only what's under the square root that ended up affecting the domain. X has to be greater than or equal to negative three halves. 
and that comes from the square root. So for today, at least, if I'm asking you about the domain, you're just looking at the square roots. And anything here, like if instead of an x squared, I had a 7x cubed, well, we still just need what's under the square root not to be negative. The problem hasn't changed at all. And this is still our answer. Let's take this opportunity to extend our interval notation. So thus far in this course, when we've used interval notation, it's because X has been between something. Like if X were between five and seven, that's the interval from five to seven. We're including seven thanks to this square bracket. And that's because seven is less than or equal to itself. We're not including this five because five is not bigger than itself. And now we're going to take this interval notation and we're going to extend it to include statements like this, where X is bigger than something or X is less than something. And the way we're going to do this is as follows. To use interval notation here, X should be trapped between two values. We have this value that's less than X. We should find a value that's greater than X. And the way we do this is kind of cheating maybe, but we say that any number is less than infinity. So X is greater than or equal to negative three halves, but it's less than infinity. And then we convert this into interval notation in kind of the ordinary way, you have to be a little careful converting the inequalities we're getting here to interval notation. Interval notation is always the smaller number on the left the largest number on the right. So, I mean, infinity isn't really a number, but negative three halves is smaller than infinity. That should be our intuition. So it's negative three halves on the left, infinity, on the right. And we include the negative three halves thanks to that or equal thing. We never include infinity. Intervals are intervals of numbers. Infinity isn't a number. It cannot be included in an interval. So it's always an open parenthesis next to any infinity symbols. No exceptions to that. 
And let's see. Looking through these examples, X is greater than or equal to two. Now, X may be greater than or equal to two, but it's still less than infinity. So if we want to, or if we are instructed to, we can write this as an interval. And again, you have to be careful with these intervals because when we have these inequalities, the smaller number can be on either side. Here, the smaller number is on the right. The smaller number could just as easily be on the left. So if you want to convert this to an inequality, you have to ask yourself, which is the smaller, which is bigger, and make sure that in your in a quality, the smaller term in your interval, sorry, the smaller term is on the left, the bigger term is on the right. I kind of got to this frame and zoomed past it. Here, X is already less than or equal to one fifth, or one fifth is greater than or equal to X. So saying that infinity is bigger than X isn't helpful here. I mean, we already know that one fifth is bigger than X. If we want to use an interval notation, we need to complete that string of inequalities and get something smaller than X. And we'll think of infinity as being size. So that is to say, we'll think of having positive infinity and negative infinity. And X is between negative infinity and one fifth. Again, if you're using interval notation, you need to proceed with due care. You need to ask yourself, What's the smaller number? What's the bigger number? And then when you use interval notation, sorry, I know my handwriting sort of slats when I write like that, but when you use interval notation, it's smaller <laughs> per month. Question. It's a bracket. Oh, yeah. you're right. It is. Thank you. Because of this, or equal to. Let me fix that. Again, whenever you use this notation, it's smaller, comma, bigger. And just like we can't include positive infinity we can never include negative infinity. So if we've got this symbol, it's always an open parenthesis. One last piece of notation, all the numbers sometimes you'll see all of the numbers represented by a kind of funky looking R, but other times you'll see this 
as O of the numbers that are greater than negative infinity, but less than positive infinity. So if they're asked to use interval notation and you've got something like that, this is how you do that. Okay. Uh, well, should I ask if there were any questions? Ten.